Hola, I made a new Discord server. It's called Omen Nexus. If you want to join the community, make some new friends, interact with me, or keep up with future projects and stuff, feel free to click the top link in the bio below to join. Okay, let's get started. After a long 10 brutal years of silence, we're finally treated to the conclusion of the Metalocalypse franchise. Yes, that's right everybody, praise the giant fireball in the sky. We did it, Reddit. We did it. Army of the Doomstar is finally here, and today, your internet daddy, aka me, is here to review and discuss the ending of what I personally consider part of the holy trinity of Adult Swim. Now just a quick heads up before we dive into this heavy movie, here is your one and only spoiler warning. We'll be delving into plot details that might reveal key elements of the story, so if you have not seen the movie yet and want to experience it without any spoilers, you might want to hold off on watching this video any further. So go check out the movie and then come back afterwards. I'd also highly recommend revisiting the Doomstar Requiem before starting Army of the Doomstar, just for a quick recap. However, if you're the type of person who just doesn't really care about spoilers, and you're here to have a good time, then uh, cool, feel free to continue watching. But with all that said, let's get wild. So to briefly summarize, the Army of the Doomstar film takes place pretty much right after the events of the Doomstar Requiem. After rescuing Toki from the Revengeancers and defeating the Metal Masked Assassin in the Doomstar Requiem, Deathclock holds a press conference to discuss a new tour and music. However, Nathan is struggling with post-traumatic stress from the entire ordeal of the musical. This leads him to pass out during their first performance back, causing plans to be put on hold as he recovers. Toki is also regressing to a childlike state as a coping mechanism. During Ishnifis' memorial, Charles Oftenson, now leader of the Church of the Black Clock, tasks Nathan with writing the Song of Salvation to prevent the Doomstar from destroying the Earth. However, Nathan initially declines and considers settling down with Abigail, but she rejects his proposal in one of the most cringe-inducing scenes ever. Nathan then faces a confrontation with his fans outside the church and becomes visibly frustrated, leading him to, and I quote, break up with them. Nathan, facing a lot of inner turmoil, decides to prioritize the music. The band then embarks on a journey to a secret hideaway to mentally train and prepare to write and perform the Song of Salvation with the help of their spiritual leader, Dick Nubbler. Yeah, who could have seen that coming? Meanwhile, General Crozier temporarily breaks free from Mr. Salacia's control and tries to reveal the Tribunal's true motives. Yeah, that's right, he's on our side, baby. However, he's stopped by Orlog before Salacia regains control. Salacia targets William Murderface for possession, leading Murderface to sabotage what was left of Nathan's confidence and reveal the location of the Army of the Doomstar. Following tons of training and Nathan taking drugs to see the Whale Prophet, the band begins performing the Song of Salvation, in quotes, but just as the band begins to perform, Nathan realizes that it's the wrong song. Instead, the band performs aortic desecration. The Doomstar approaches, initiating the Metalocalypse and causing global destruction. Oh good god, this place looks like f***ing Florida. No, not Florida! The U.S. Army and the Tribunal's militia attack the band faster than a clown on coke. Yes, he's in the film, by the way. Resulting in tons of casualties, including the Army of the Doomstar and Nubbler. Rest in peace, Nubbler, you wonderful bastard. I ain't gonna lie, I teared up a little bit watching that. Meanwhile, Possessed Murderface escapes, and Crozier finally breaks free from Salacia's control by jumping into the water, causing his hold to break. Yet as it turns out, well, I mean, we already knew this, but Salacia really doesn't like the ocean. Crozier finds Death Clock, explains the situation, and they form a bit of an alliance. They track down Murderface, perform an exorcism on him, convince him that he's a very important part of the band and that his job is to suck. And although that doesn't sound super nice on paper, the entire scene is very touching and it truly brings the band closer together. With the help of John Fru, the band prepares to perform the correct Song of Salvation, and they do! But Orlog orders an attack. Salacia captures Death Clock and begins harnessing the Doomstar's power, which as it turns out, isn't just a star, it's a portal to another place and time, and a weapon. Salacia had the biggest superconductor built so that he can pull the star closer to Earth in order to absorb some souls to become whole again. However, he needs a source of power to wedge open the portal. That source of power, or force, is Death Clock. So the band is tied to the conductor, the portal is opened, Salacia absorbs some souls, Senator Stampingson blows up due to one of the souls going haywire. Yeah, good, good, yeah, f that guy. I hated him. Nathan somehow breaks free along with the rest of the band and they make their way to safety. 
John Fru plants a bomb to destroy Celestia's supercomputer, but tragically perishes. Rest in peace, you hell of a motherfucker. Celestia's absorption is complete, and now he's inside of what I'm dubbing as a cocoon, which means that Death Clock are no longer needed and are ordered to be killed by Orlog. However, a full-blown battle ensues between the Tribunal and the true army of the Doomstar, aka the fans of Death Clock. Together, they eliminate the Tribunal and Orlog. Cursor regains control of the US military as well. Celestia awakens from his cocoon thing and turns into this giant alien pyramid monster, almost reminiscent of an alien from like Ben 10 or something. Attack on Titan? Doesn't matter, this guy's insane looking. Nathan, the rest of the band, and even the fans use the power of the Death Lights to push Celestia above the water before the Whale Prophet swallows him and sends him back to hell where he came from. In the aftermath, Nathan acknowledges the fans' role as the real army of the Doomstar, fostering a new bond. The group and fans celebrate their victory, marking the end of the series. So while I do have a couple of questions and concerns about the film, overall, I'm quite content with this movie. Army of the Doomstar manages to wrap up this extensive story effectively within its 80 minute runtime. I'll admit, I got a bit emotional at times, particularly during the moments when Nubbler and John Fru met their ends. I'll never forget it, I spent three days just sitting in my bed wondering, why? Why them? The animation was truly impressive as well, arguably the best Metalocalypse has ever looked visually. The confrontation between Charles and Orlog was gratifying as well, especially when Orlog was dismantled. I've always had such a strong dislike for him, perhaps even more so than Salacia, so witnessing his demise was really quite satisfying. I don't know what that says about me, whether that makes me a psychopath or not, but just, I, I don't know, watching him get crushed to bits after all these years is just fulfilling. I must admit, I ended up rewatching this quite a few times, which I didn't mind at all. I don't think anybody who's a fan of this series would mind rewatching this wonderful movie. However, during my initial viewing, I did find it a bit challenging to catch all of the dialogue between characters. Like, at least to me, it seemed like the music score might have been a tad bit louder than the voices, but that could just be my perception. After the first watch, I turned on subtitles and it definitely enhanced my subsequent viewings. But I don't know, let me know in the comments below if you guys have had some audio problems with Army of the Doomstar. Maybe it's just me. Maybe my TV sucks. It was also a great experience spotting numerous iconic background characters from the series in the crowd during the climactic battle. Battle, even though many of them likely met their end during the fight. There was also a somewhat unexpected moment when Dr. Roxo performed at Ishnipis' funeral, and while it might not have been entirely necessary in my opinion, it was still quite entertaining to have one final glimpse of the character. I think the movie struck a nice balance between humor and seriousness, which is what I anticipated. You know, it's important for the film to maintain that equilibrium, offering both genuine, serious, and incredibly funny moments. A few moments that really uh, tickled my fancy, really busted my pastrami if you will, were Nubbler's tumble down the stairs with a gong, and also the scene at Ishnifis' funeral where Pickles, Toki, Squizgar, and Murderface caused quite a spectacle in front of everyone. I, I just I could not stop laughing at those moments, those two in particular. There's a ton of other funny moments, but those two really stuck out to me. In the movie, there's a scene where Nathan connects with the whale prophet after consuming some weed of the sea- hold on, there's a moth in my room, get the hell out of here. Go away. And tell your friends. Anyway, there's a scene in the movie where Nathan connects with the whale prophet after consuming some weed of the sea. Now, interestingly, a similar scene is present in Brendan Small's Galacticon music video for Nightmare. Now, for quite a while, there was a strong rumor that Brendan Small's album Galacticon 2 Become the Storm was crafted as a way to conclude the Metalocalypse story. Since Brendan doesn't possess the rights to the series, it's said he used this record to wrap up the narrative. But of course, he never officially confirmed this rumor, although there is a lot of proof through the lyrics and tracks that pretty much gives it away as the conclusion to the story. Hell, after watching this movie, I could really trace a lot of key moments from the film back to some of the tracks on the record, like the tracks Exodus and My Name is Murder. Consequently, the imagery in Nightmare was most likely intended as a preview for what was planned, and I think that that's a pretty neat piece of foreshadowing. Another thing I really enjoyed was the dynamic between Crozier and John Fru. 
That was such a highlight for me, even though I wished they could have collaborated for a bit longer. Of course, I understand that 80 minutes is simply insufficient to delve into the side characters more extensively. Speaking of not having enough time to focus on other characters, I recall hearing from somewheres that Abigail and Toki were meant to develop a stronger bond after the events of the Doomstar Requiem due to their shared experiences. I don't know if that's something Brendan said or if that was just a rumor, but either way, it was still a bit disappointing that there wasn't any sort of interaction between these two characters in the film, especially after everything they went through together. Additionally, Abigail's limited appearance lasting only around five minutes felt a tad bit underwhelming, especially as she primarily appeared to bid Nathan farewell. I don't know, this is just me. I would have appreciated more screen time for her, but considering the constraints, I understand why her role was relatively brief. You know, realistically, Abigail was introduced relatively late in the series, and if Metalocalypse had been given a final season rather than a movie, there might have been more room for her character's development element, but since she wasn't really a super important character throughout this entire series, it's understandable why they kept her appearance quick and brief. With the movie's runtime of about 80 minutes, the creators had to work with the available time wisely. Although on one hand, I could have accepted the movie delving into a possible connection between Nathan and Abigail, maybe evolving into something more as the film progressed, it would have also been satisfying if Abigail had expressed the idea that they should take a pause, focus on personal growth, and then consider reigniting any evolved However, I'm completely fine with the initial separation and then following Nathan's personal growth journey though. I also noticed that Squizgar didn't really speak a lot during this film, and uh, he also didn't have sex with anyone, which is totally bizarre and out of character, but you know, maybe that's just me nitpicking. <laughs> that's totally me nitpicking, I don't really care. I'm also a bit puzzled by a scene early in the movie. There's a scene at the beginning of the movie where the tribunal are in Norway, watching an object fall from the sky and hit a marker, and Orlog mentions Farewell Sister of the Krakish. Now after hearing from Crozier that the Doomstar is also a portal, this personally leaves me to believe that maybe Orlog was possibly attempting to summon creatures through the Doomstar portal to aid in Celestia's takeover. I do remember Crozier also mentioning that Celestia was bringing friends along for the, uh, and I quote, great reuniting. However, the creature might have been consumed by atmospheric entry due to the portal's distance from Earth at this point in the film. And as for the line, farewell sister of the Krakish, is this Krakish related to or connected to Musta Krakish, the red lake troll? Maybe it's a nod or an easter egg or something? Now originally I thought there was just something wrong with me and I wasn't quite understanding this scene, but I did go on the Metalocalypse subreddit to see if anyone else was a tad confused and surprisingly, there was a lot of people that were somewhat confused and were also thinking that maybe this Krakish is related to Musta Krakish. Some people also think that this is related to the comics, which I personally didn't read, so I'm a little bit out of the loop on that. Surprisingly, even Lucian from Deathcast and the Weekly Geekly brought this moment up in his recent Army of the Doomstar review that he recorded with his wife recently, which I totally recommend checking out after you're done with this video. You know I have to support the homies. So I'm curious what you guys have to say about this scene, so drop some comments below on what you believe happened here. While the guest voice actors didn't play any huge roles in the film, it was still nice to hear some cameos from Amy Lee of Evanescence, King Diamond, Scott Ian from Anthrax, and Thundercat as well. I also really enjoyed a lot of the callbacks in this film, like the line, I'm a gear in the wheel of the clock, I fear not my mortality, I will serve to the best of my ability, which was first spoken in the first episode by Jean-Pierre the French Chef. And also the fact that the series began in Batsford, Norway, and ended in Batsford, Norway. I mean, there are quite a number of other callbacks in this film, but I think you guys get the point. This series really came full circle, and I like it. The only other tiny detail that I really wish the movie had time to cover is Silesia's origin, but besides that, the movie's solid. Oh, and uh, Toki and Squizgar's dynamic in the film. One of my favorite things about Metalocalypse is the hilarious, like, younger, older brother relationship that Toki and Squizgar share. And although neither of these characters really talk a lot during this film, the dynamic is still there. Like when Toki aids Squizgar after the first attack, and also when Squizgar jumps into Toki's arms towards the end of the film. I could probably continue to go on talking about some of my favorite moments in this film, but these were just a lot of the highlights that I wanted to cover. With Army of the Doomstar comes along two brand new musical pieces, the Army of the Doomstar soundtrack and Death Album 4. Now firstly, the soundtrack is amazing. I mean, the film's score was just immaculate. I can't really say much more on it, it's just a fantastic score. But as for Death Album 4, well where do I even start? 
probably one of the greatest metal albums in the history of mankind and that is not an exaggeration. Although Aortic Desecration might be the wrong song, it's still a killer addition to the record, in fact, it's part of my workout playlist. The Song of Salvation holds a lot of meaning as well. And then there are songs like Gardener of Vengeance that have zero business being brutal and catchy, but they are, and I'm all for it. In fact, I'm thinking of playing it next time I mow my lawn. And of course, we get to the concluding part of the Mermaider series with Mermaider 3. It serves as a fitting ending to this wonderfully composed album. I also appreciate how the first Death album began with Mermaider, and the fourth album wraps up with Mermaider 3. Again, the thing with the full circle, everything comes full circle in Metalocalypse, and it's so satisfying. So the army of the Doomstar ends, and the world's kind of destroyed, so what's next? Well, as for the future of Earth, that's basically up to us. What I admire from this film is that although it closes the official book of Metalocalypse, it allows us, the fans, the army of the Doomstar if you want to go that far, to continue to brainstorm, elevate, and envision what happens next. Does society rebuild? Do the fans become the new Clocketeers? Do Death Clock continue to produce music? Is the world just Florida? God, I hope not. Well, we leave those questions up to the fanfic writers, the theorists, and of course, the beautiful bastards at Deathcast. You know, for me, my personal headcanon is that society does rebuild. Everything goes back to normal, minus the giant fireball in the sky. And Death Clock released Album 4 right after, just for the fans. Now, there's always that chance that a new threat could be lurking in the shadows, but as of now, at least in my head, the world is at peace. But what does Brendan Small think about the ending, though? Does he have any plans to continue the series? Does this movie also mark the end of Death Clock as a performing act? Well, in a new Revolver Magazine interview with the head honcho, the big cheese himself, Brendan Small, we learn a little bit about what happens next. The interviewer asked Small if the Army of the Doomstar film marks the end of the Death Clock saga, will the forthcoming live tour mark the end of Death Clock as a touring act? And Brendan Small replied with the following. Not necessarily. Let me say this. This is the end of the Tribunal, and it's the end of a few characters along the way, too. Some helpful people that all started out kind of working for the bad guys, but then, in one way or another, became part of the Death Clock world. So, this is the end of that story. Do I have plans for the future? I don't. But if Death Clock wants to keep on playing, and it's still fun, and we can make it all work and make everybody happy, I don't see why we should ever stop. Unless at some point, this music is so hard to play and we're so old that we can't, which I can see happening too. So it appears that currently there are no concrete plans to continue the series, which obviously is understandable. Like, I totally get it. I don't know where Brendan would take things from here anyways. Like, the prophecy is over. The world is saved. Our heroes grew up. It's a solid conclusion. How do you take that and evolve it? Besides maybe doing, like, some type of epilogue. However, there doesn't seem to be any strong opposition to the idea of a continuation either. And as I'm recording this, I just stumbled upon a brand new interview with Brendan Small from Heavy Consequence. And according to this interview, Brendan does provide some insight into one of his ideas for what he's dubbed as the next version of Metalocalypse. According to him, there was one song on Death Album 4 that pretty much embodies what the future would be. Take a listen to this clip from the interview. There's a song that embodies what I think the next version would be. And I don't think, I don't know that we'll ever get there because I don't, I mean, again, you need somebody else to pay for it. But there's one song on the record that I think is just kind of like embodies what, what, what the future would be and it would I don't know if it would be as mystical or as crazy but it would be funny. I guess as long as Brendan has an idea and as long as the network is on board however given Adult Swim's past interactions with Brendan this is probably the final installment of the series. Look I'm fine with that. The fact that Adult Swim finally gave Brendan his conclusion is more than enough for me. Like I'm satisfied at the end of the day. As a fan I am totally satisfied with this. I have a proper ending to one of my favorite Adult Swim shows and I get to do lunges and squats while listening to the brand new Death album at the gym. But if Death Clock members remain interested in playing and finding it enjoyable, the possibility of ongoing contiguation remains open, at least in the live aspect of things. So to conclude this review, I am truly thrilled for Brendan Small, the entire team, and everyone involved in bringing this incredible movie to life. Their dedication and hard work are evident, and as a devoted Adult Swim and Metalocalypse fan, I can only express my deep gratitude. They've poured their heart and souls into this project, and I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for concluding one of the most remarkable stories in adult animation. I'm grateful for being introduced to this fantastic show at such a young age, even if I was a little bit too young to be watching it. I think I was like six when I first stumbled 
stumbled upon Adult Swim and this series. Metal Metalocalypse marked my, probably my first exposure to metal music as well, and it's still a big reason why I'm so passionate about the genre today. It's also influenced my journey as a music creator as well. So anyways, thank you Adult Swim and Brendan and everyone for making this happen. My life feels complete and I can die of happiness now. As for you guys, I believe that if you're a Metalocalypse fan like me, you will most likely be satisfied with this conclusion as well. But I'm pretty sure like all of you guys watching this have either seen the movie or you just don't care enough to give the series a shot, but you just want to hear me talk for like 20 minutes. And hey, that's totally okay too. Join a new Discord server, we could talk more in there. But anyways, I would highly recommend you go to your local Target or Amazon.com to pick up not only this movie, but also the complete series as well, in order to support the franchise and the hardworking people behind it. You can, of course, also buy Plantasm and the uh, the brand new Venture Bros movie, which uh, for those of you who sometimes like to come in my comments and ask if I plan on completing the holy trinity of Adult Swim in terms of icebergs, you bet your sweet bippy I am. Look at this thumbnail. Thumbnail's not done yet. I wanted to wait for the brand new movie to come out, and it's out, and so I'm rewatching the entire series as we speak, and then I'm gonna watch the movie, and then I'm gonna put together an iceberg, and I might even do a movie review too. But yeah, with that said, if you guys were satisfied with this film and you enjoyed my crappy commentary, then do me a favor and leave a like. Subscribe to the channel if you're brand new around here. Click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a brand new video. Follow me on all of my social links, and join the brand new Discord server. Top link in the bio below. Have a great day, everyone, and remember, that this movie was brutal.